Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Laird. I'm a developer on the Ensemble core team, and today I'll be talking to you about the Ensemble REST API. To start, let's go over what we'll be discussing today. We'll go over what is Ensemble, methods to access Ensemble data, the Ensemble REST server documentation, how to query the REST server, we'll run two example scripts, and we'll discuss where to go for help. Ensemble has gene builds for approximately 70 species. We have gene trees, regulation, and variation data. The VEP tool, you can display your own data on our browser, access bulk data via Biomart, the Perl API, the REST API, and it's all completely open source. Ensemble has a release cycle of every two to three months. This involves updating the genomes, the underlying software, the gene trees, variation and regulation data, plus any new tools and interface updates. We release in cycles like this, so you'll always be able to go back to past releases and find the same version of the data you did your initial analysis on. For those not working with the vertebrate species or the handful of model organisms in Ensemble, we have a sister site, Ensemble Genomes, where you'll find bacteria, fungi, metazoa, plant, and protist genomes. In the Ensemble data model, our primary feature types are genes, transcripts, and exons. A gene is defined by a set of alternatively spliced transcripts. A transcript is a set of exons, and peptides are not explicitly stored in the database. They're computed on the fly from transcript objects. Features have defined locations on the genome. Start and end are always plotted on the forward strand. This means the start coordinate returned by the Ensemble APIs will always be less than the end even if the feature is transcribed from the reverse strand. We have a number of ways to access Ensemble data, depending on the scale you need to access the data. Many of you probably are familiar with the Genome Browser. We also have a Perl API where you can bulk access our data via FTP site or access our MySQL servers directly. Today we'll be focusing on the REST API. The Ensemble REST API provides a language agnostic method to access the Ensemble data sets. However, it only offers a fraction of the functionality of the Perl API, though new endpoints are continually being added over the releases. As mentioned earlier, the Ensemble REST server has vertebrate species plus a number of model organisms. For those still using GRCH37, we maintain a separate REST server. However, the data on this server was frozen at Ensemble release 75. As of release 87, we now have archives of the REST service. This means from Ensemble 87 onwards, you can go back and access past versions of Ensemble via the REST interface. These will follow the same five years of archives model that our website does. In the Ensemble genome species, they maintain their own REST instance at rest.ensemblegenomes.org. So what is a REST API? It describes how one system can communicate with another. Typically, this is over HTTP or HTTPS, providing a machine-readable language agnostic method for remote data to access remote data and services. It also has the benefit of being human-readable because it's using the same protocol as your web browser. You can send a request with a URL and receive back formatted, formatted data responses. So let's look at our first REST call. If we type in this URL for the ping endpoint on the Ensemble server, it's the same URL you could type into your browser or using your software. And since it returns JSON formatted data, it's easily readable by both our software and humans. However, the ping, ping, ping endpoint isn't very useful for analyses beyond checking if a server is alive. So let's look at another example. Again, we have a URL that can be used by our software or by humans in a browser to look at ensemble data. This makes debugging easier. Any request for data you want your software to make, you can simply type it yourself into your web browser to test if you've written the URL correctly or to explore what your data you'll receive back. In this case, we've asked the lookup endpoint to tell us everything Ensemble knows about a particular gene based on its stable ID. This returns a JSON formatted record which can be easily manipulated by your software. If you open the Ensemble REST server main, server's main page in your browser, you'll see the documentation listing the endpoints we provide for accessing Ensemble data. 
The Ensemble REST server documentation is divided into functional groupings to help you find the data you're looking for, such as comparative genomics, cross-references, variation, the VEP tool, a GA for GH beacon server, and so on. I'm not going to go over all the endpoints in detail. I'm going to discuss how to run queries and interact with the data. But please take a look on rest.ensemble.org to see a full list of Ensemble data available through the REST API. By clicking on a particular endpoint, you'll get more details on how to use that endpoint. Let's look at some of the features of the documentation page. At the top, you'll see the method and the URL of the endpoint. You'll also see any variables that you need to provide to the endpoint denoted with a colon in front of the name. In this case, we're being told the endpoint takes an ID as part of the URL. Like in the example we saw a few slides ago and here again, look up, then ID, then the ID you're looking for. This becomes the, U the URL your software uses or you type into the web browser for testing. There's a list of parameters the endpoint takes and these are grouped into either required or optional parameters. It also says what type of parameters each is, a string, a boolean, etc and some of the examples, uh, some examples of possible values. If the parameter isn't in the template at the very top, it means it's added onto the end of the, of the URL in standard HTTP fashion after a question mark. As seen in this URL, using the expand option, our previous lookup URL with the expand option set to true added to the end. To the right, is resource information. This says if the endpoint gets uses get or post and lists the responses it the response type it supports. For example, we can see the lookup endpoint can return JSON, XML, or JSON P formats by setting the content type parameter or a header. As seen in the example URL from earlier and visible here, content type equals application JSON. Multiple parameters are chained together using an ampersand or colon. You can test any of this by building a URL and simply pasting it into your web browser. If you scroll down on the documentation of an endpoint, you'll see we have sample output and code. There will be at least one example of the output you can expect from this endpoint, as well as some sample code in a few popular languages of a very basic example on how to access the endpoint. In this case, we see a simple Perl script for accessing the lookup endpoint, but you can also use C examples in Python, Ruby, Java, Curl, or even wget. Let's briefly talk about what happens when you visit a website in your browser or your software talks to the REST server. When you make a request, the formatting of the message sent back by the server is standardized in the HTTP specifications. A response will have a status, one or more lines of header, and finally, a body after a blank line. This is usually hidden from you when you're using web browser as you only see the final rendered body. But it becomes important when using a REST service. There's information our server puts in there to help you determine when your request has failed or if you're making more queries than you're allowed per hour. We've all seen the 404 message when surfing the web. This happens when you visit a page that doesn't exist. The status codes are standardized and we use a number of them to communicate to your software why your request may have failed. So it's important to do error checking when using the REST API and have your script change its behavior based on the status code it receives. The Ensemble REST API uses a subset of status codes shown here. Code 200 means the request has succeeded. 400 would mean the data you're looking for wasn't found. 403, you've submitted too many queries in a very rapid succession. 404 indicates your, uh, your form, your Request is badly formatted. You probably spelled something incorrectly in it. 408 would indicate a timeout, likely an issue on our end, but if it persists, perhaps decrease the size of your query. 429 would be you've exceeded the reasonable usage limit we've set on the server, and more on that shortly. And a 503 means we're having issues on our end of the server. You should try again later. Any software you write to use the API should adapt its behavior based on these status codes. As mentioned earlier, the REST API supports a number of content types depending on the endpoint you're using. A content type allows a server to send the same data using different formats depending what the client prefers. For example, the gene tree endpoints, you'll find content types such as PhiloXML. For endpoints 
you'll likely use, uh, for most endpoints, you'll likely use JSON, as every major language has a good JSON library to handle that format. Going back to our previous example, we asked for JSON. As you'll see when you look at the available endpoints, they pretty much return atomic sets of data, which have limited usefulness in their own. Because JSON is easily machine parsable, the real power of the REST API comes in extracting fields from the response to use in subsequent requests. So let's look at the lookup endpoint again. This time, we're looking at the variant that searches by symbol. In this case, we have to specify the species and the symbol we want to search for, IRAC4. We receive a gene record back, and in this record, we see the ensemble stable ID for the gene. Most languages, as I mentioned, have great, language, uh, great uh, libraries uh, built in to parse uh, JSON. So you can access these structures very easily programmatically. You can then extract the piece you need. In this case, we're going to do the stable ID and use it in your software for a subsequent query. So we'll extract the stable ID from the field ID in the record and fetch the sequence for this gene in FASTA format. And we'll print the first 200 or so characters in the, of the returned results. This is a very simple example, but as you, as you can start to see, the power of the REST API in digging through the ensemble data, set, data sets and retrieving the data you need. So we're going to look at a quick live demo here on trying to extract information using these endpoints. We're going to pull together what we just did in the last few slides and make a single script where we'll fetch a gene based on symbol, we'll extract the ensemble stable ID, and then from that return JSON record, we'll use that stable ID to fetch the sequence and then print that out. Here you can see our script we're going to use that puts all these pieces together. We have the endpoints we want to access, the lookup endpoint and the sequence endpoint. We have a little helper function which is just going to do the hard, the, the heavy work of fetching the uh, requests that we ask for. And then we fetch IRAC4 using the symbol or the lookup with symbol endpoint. We're going to print out the stable ID we find in that record. Then we're going to use that stable ID to go back and fetch the sequence in text XML format or FASTA format and then print out the first few hundred characters of the sequence. If we run our script, it's gone out, it's made the first query, it's found the gene record based on symbol IRAC4, it's gone out a second time and asked for the sequence and prints it out for us. Some of our endpoints, some of our endpoints allow sending post requests. We do this to allow you to batch multiple queries in a single request. Think of it as asking a staff member at a grocery store where a handful of ingredients are. You could keep going back every time and asking, where's the milk, where's the flour, where's the vanilla? Or you could go up and ask uh, all at once, where's the milk, flour, and vanilla, please? These bundled queries are sent in the, the message body rather than the URL as the same way as you submit a form of data when you're surfing on Amazon or Google. Now a useful tool I want to quickly mention is Postman. It's a plugin for Chrome that allows you to send post requests with these bodies. It's very useful for exploring the endpoints and debugging since you obviously can't send a post request and a message body in a browser like you can with a GET request as we've seen until now. So here's a simple script in Python, using a post request to send multiple stable IDs in a single request, it sends a chunk of JSON with these IDs to the server. We can see they're bundled up into a single chunk of JSON and then sent off to the post via the post type of submission. And the server sends back a batch with all the records we've asked for in the query. To ensure no one monopolizes our finite resources, our REST API has rate limits on the number of requests you're allowed to send per hour. This is another re good reason to use batch requests via POST. You can access more data without exceeding the request limits, since POST would count as a single request, regardless of the number of records you asked for. The REST API 
has headers to each response, telling you how many requests are allowed per hour. In this case, we see it's 55,000, or 15 or so per second. We're shown how many requests you have remaining before we ask you to pause, and how long before this window resets. If you do exceed the rate limit, you receive back a 429 status code, and you will not receive any data back. In addition, you receive a retry after header telling you how many seconds your software needs to wait before sending another request. So let's look at another, the, the rate limiting in action here. We're going to write a script that loops 25 times and just pings the ping endpoint and prints the status code and the rate limit. If a retry, re, retry after header is received, print that as well, and we'll see what happens when we try to query the endpoint multiple times rapidly in succession. As you can see, after 18, 17 queries, we've hit the rate limit. We've asked for queries too quickly from the endpoint. And suddenly it's saying, nope, 429, denied. And it's asking us to wait two seconds before we try again. And if we keep trying, it's going to keep saying, nope, we're going to wait. You're going to have to wait two more seconds before we allow you to query again. So to summarize, today we looked at making basic queries using the REST API, how to use the documentation, status codes and ensuring your queries work properly, content types, and different data formats available, rate limits for the API, and using POST to batch your queries. We hope this was a useful overview of the Ensemble REST API. Further documentation is available on the REST website, including a user's guide, a change log of updates made in the, in the API from release to release. You can also send any specific questions to our help desk or join our mailing list. If you use Ensemble in our web services in your research, we ask you to cite us. This is our most recent publication, but a list of the current and past publications can always be found on our website. If there's no questions, thank you very much for listening. And if you have, do have any questions in the future, as I mentioned, just email us and we're always here to help. Thank you.